um, session two. Session one was just a lot about introducing what the course is, providing some opportunities for students to see what is an activity anyway that they, you know, they might not even know what it is that you're talking about. Um, for the course at Berkeley right now, what we do is we take them to Lorna Hall of Science. They, well, they actually walk upstairs. And so they see activities taking place um, on the floor of the aquarium. Um, at, they go to uh, Virginia Aquarium or to Aquarium of the Pacific, places like that. So they can really get a good idea of what's going on. Um, and um, it's also the time when you talk about what are grades based on, what are all the requirements, what's homework like, and, and things like that, typical things. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to have some excerpts of it too along the way is we have a, an opportunity for the students to participate in discussion, threaded discussions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, and, the, and in this, the students have the opportunity to um, respond to a prompt, but also to respond to each other's prompts. And some of the things they say are amazing. I'm going to show you some things um, tomorrow that just came out for our class today. I'm missing our class at Berkeley today. Um, but some of the things, and they were talking about the prompt. How much does the public need to know about science anyway? So it's very interesting what the science major said about that. And I was a little surprised in some cases too. So, but I'll share some of that with you tomorrow. So today, um, I mean, for this session, um, what they do is they actually have a course reader. Um, it's, this sure it's pretty fat. I don't know what happened, but it's pretty fat. And so for each session, um, they actually read about two different papers that are on that session. So it prepares them to come into the session with a little bit of background knowledge. So for this session, these are the three readings. And I want to put them up here and just so you'll see what they're reading because the next, I'll, I'll show you the prompts of what they do with this. So the first one is, um, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, Adventures of a Curious Character. So it's about um, Feynman and when he was a kid, his experiments with ants, trying to figure out some questions about what were the ants doing and how were they doing it. Okay, he was just a kid, doing science. Um, then during the class, we actually um, distribute this second reading, which just came out in 2005 in Nature, and it's called Outsmarted by Ants. And it's a reaction to Feynman's article. Okay? And then the last one that they read is one by Jay Lemke, Articulating Communities, <laughs> Sociocultural Perspectives, on science education. Kind of looking at, is our Western European male scientific community really what science is about? Who belongs in the community? Who decides? That sort of thing. Very interesting article if you haven't had a chance to read that. So they're all in this reader. Um, and on the website, we have a, a list of all the readings that are in the reader, too, in case you're interested in, in this later. Okay, so what they do with this, come to class, and um, before I do that, I'll just show you the questions that they have. So the first one is, uh, it's a jigsaw, so diff different table groups have different questions that they're working on, and then they share them out later. The first one is, would you say that Feynman was doing science, or did it just appear scientific? When he was a kid, was he doing science, or was it just kind of appearance of scientific. What specifically about his results make you think that? Okay, so it's a double-edged sword here. We can tell whether they read the paper and also then um, have a nice discussion. Then, in the light of the response article, do you think Feynman was doing science? So once they read what the person said in Nature about Feynman, what do they think now? Do they think he was doing science? Then number three is, how is science a socially, culturally, and temporally influenced activity. They're kind of like, whoa, science is science. Social, cultural, temporal. In light of Lemke's criticism of science 
and science education as we do it, Western science in Western schools, respond to the cartoon in paragraph. Well, I don't have a paragraph here, but here's the um, cartoon. It says, it's the, a bouncer at a big club, and the name of the club is Science. And it says, everyone gets in as long as they behave scientifically. <laughs> and then it says on the wall here, all patrons must expose their ideas to testing. Thank you. Okay? So the question for the students is, what is this? What does it mean to behave scientifically? So it's also a very interesting discussion because they come up with a list. Well, this is what it means to behave scientifically. But not everyone agrees with everyone else's list for that. This um, comes from a new website. I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's by the um, University of California Museum of Paleontology, the same ones who did the Understanding Evolution website. It's a brand new website site called Understanding Science. It is excellent. You should definitely go to that. I'll even let you surf it here. Right? It's, it's a good um, one. Let's see. Okay. So finally, we get to the, the um, actual meat of the lesson. And it's all about, so what is science anyway? So obviously, we have some stereotypes of what scientists are up there. Um, Excuse me, who did you say hosted that website? Um, Understanding Science. Uh, University of California Museum of Paleontology. I think I put the, it's, if you just Google understanding science, it's the first one that comes up. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's what some of the students said when we asked them, what is science? We asked them that question. So for you folks over there, I'll, um, these are from just the students in the class, science students in the class. Science is the name we have given for the acts, processes of understanding, creating, improving, discovering, exploring of everything we believe to exist or may exist. That's amazing, right? Like science is everything. Um, everything we believe to exist or may exist. Like art, it is about interpreting the things around us. And a lot of times it involves changing something to see what happens. And then asking why and how that happened. Each one of these has a response from others, but I'm just giving you some of them. It's this long one. It's a long-winded kid in the class. <laughs> Science to me is an ongoing process to explain how everything functions. I say ongoing because the scientific process involves coming up with a hypothesis and trying to disprove it rather than trying to prove it. Based on the scientific <coughs> process of trying to disprove a hypothesis, it can be argued that no science is absolutely certain. Okay. I'll just leave it here for now. And then this one, I just put in red some of the things I wanted to emphasize. This person says it's a socially embedded idea or an essential truth. Okay. And then it seems that science is driven by societal norms. Some argue that science is the objective view of our world. The very few scientists are completely objective when interpreting their data. Okay? True or false? Okay. So, um, here we go. We're going to give you a chance to think about, for yourself, what is science. So, um, what we're going to do is just at your table group, I'm going to give you a list uh, a bunch of sentence strips. And on these sentence strips, I would like you to sort these into statements that you believe to be scientific statements. Okay. Another category would be, these aren't scientific statements. And then a third category, you know, it sounds scientific, but I don't really think it is. It just sounds like it is. Okay. Pseudoscience or things like that. Okay? Three, uh, three. And what I want you to do, most importantly, is think about what is your criteria that you're using to sort. Okay? 
What is your criteria? And that's what we're going to discuss when we come back to Whole Foods. Okay? This is just a, this one just says, you may be interested to know that global warming, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other natural disasters are a direct effect of the shrinking numbers of pirates since the 1800s. As you can see, there is a statistically significant inverse relationship between pirates and global temperature. Finally, okay. Did you know that? Okay. All right. Okay. What I'd like to know, um, so we can share with everyone some of the comments that I've heard as walking around the tables. So, what criteria did you use to place things into the scientific category? What criteria did you use? Who would like to share something? Yeah. We uh, came up with uh, it's evidence and data based. And evidence and data based. And uh, it's got a testable hypothesis that's also repeatable. Wow. Testable hypothesis also repeatable. What, say more about data based. Um, evidence. There's real numbers. Uh, they, it, I think it's part of that testable hypothesis. They made observations. They they took numbers and, and you know based their hypothesis on those those data. Okay. How about reflections about that comments? A just comment. Scientific. Well, we can agree with, and we also said that that um, looking upon um, how much research has been done already on that topic is also more of the scientific. There's more databases out there on it, so it's more able to, to test it. Okay. Do you have an example that would support what you just said? <laughs> or I can come back to you. Sorry, I could go on the platform. I've been chosen to read it, so. <laughs> the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been rising over the past 200 years and is now higher than any time in the past. 100,000 years at 380 parts per million. Okay, so that to you is a scientific statement? Or no? Mm -hmm. Oh! Yeah, yeah it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a group, we chose that it was. Mm -hmm. So that's a scientific statement based on criteria. Yeah. What was your criteria? Mm -hmm. That there is um, a lot of facts and information and data for database and um, research that's been done already prior on this topic. Okay. Right. Other ideas about that? Yes, Mark. Um, we didn't always agree necessarily, but we did agree that we couldn't agree that that was anything more than scientific sounding because we don't know the background. In other words, <laughs> science, to me, it's a tool and it's based, it's kind of the search for verifiable reality regardless of your language, your world view, whatever, it's a set of tools. But we don't know where these numbers came from. We don't know how many studies, we don't know anything about this. So then it becomes a socially um, mediated piece of information. So just with this much, we don't have enough to evaluate. What more would you need on a statement like that? The, the, so this is the statement about the global climate change, that we know Temperature is rising. We have data. I think it is also group's knowledge and our own backgrounds in the area and where we want to categorize something. So tell me a little bit more about that. Um, when he was saying he wasn't sure if there was enough data, but we feel that we have um, a strong background in that topic, that we feel that there is a substantial amount of data to verify that. Very interesting. Okay, what do others of you think? So we have two tables. One believes that that one is a scientific statement, and others who think that perhaps it's not. Where did others categorize that one? Yeah. Well, we Carl. categorized it as a scientific statement. But mm -hmm. I can understand what Mark's saying. But, uh, I think there is enough data that we're all aware of <laughs> to substantiate that statement. Mm -hmm. I think also that the one with aliens from another planet built the Egyptian pyramids. Um, these two ladies said, well, no, there, there is data on that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so 
And they feel strongly about it as well. So should, based on our categorization, should we be placing that one in the science? Well, it, it, was kind of the, it brought up that question about categorizing it doesn't have to do with whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> Is it scientific? Because some people have gathered, some people have gathered evidence and tested that hypothesis and come to a conclusion. Right? They've gone through some process that could be called scientific, even if I might not agree with their, you know, their conclusion or whatever. Maybe it's a scientific statement. So, so if we depend on your your criteria, right? if your criteria is gathering data, having numbers, having people with backgrounds say, yeah, that's true, then you could put some of those things, mm -hmm. categorize them as scientific statements. If on the other hand you said it's got to be testable, mm -hmm. I have to see what that test was. What was your test? You might not put that in a scientific statement. Mm -hmm. So it does depend on what do we as a community of scientists describe what are those criteria that we can um, think about so that we can also help our students to understand what is it that we're talking about when we're saying science? And what is it that we can do to help them so that they are also doing science, thinking scientifically, and so forth? What does that even mean? Okay, and is it different for Western cultures versus other cultures? So, um, what about, how about one idea of what you put in the not scientific, but sound scientific? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think for us, we, we were very skeptical whenever we encountered a statement that was very diffuse. For example, global warming will be good, or global oh. warming was invented by liberals. <laughs> you know, those were not really well explained or categorized, so then, we said, oh, that, you know, even agreeing to what good is, or the pervasiveness of good, or what liberals are, mm -hmm. okay, that's mm -hmm. not scientific. You know, it's, mm -hmm. It sounds scientific, but there's yeah, so much yeah. gray zoning there that mm -hmm. we could not get to an agreement as a society. So mm -hmm. we're just like, mm -hmm. Now, this, this global warming thing has a lot of both far reaching effects, thinking about how the public perceives scientists' understanding, knowledge, what they've done, and what it means for the future, right? So this one is really wrapped up in what is science anyway, and how do we know that what people are saying is actually facts, okay? So one of the things, um, students, in, when they do this, these are all science students, and they are just scratching their head and racking their brain, they're going, I've been doing science, you know, since at least for four years, right, in most cases, longer, four years in college, and they're like, I've never wondered about that before. I've never really thought about what is science. What is it that I've chosen to do? What does that mean? How could I, I can't even define my subject area, sort of thing. So, um, that we share just a few ideas from other people about what they think science is too. After the students have had a chance to really grapple with their understanding of science, and for each of these we never say which is scientific and which is not scientific. That's not really the point of it. It's really looking at what is your criteria. So this one is by Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptics Society, and this is what he says about science. Science is a set of methods designed to describe and interpret observed or inferred phenomena, past or present, and aimed at building a testable body of knowledge open to rejection or confirmation. So obviously that is what he's basing his skeptic society on. Science, to be science, it has to fit this criteria. Okay? And his, one of the big criteria is this testable. Okay? Well, he's not the only one who talks about science, imagine. Uh, Eugenie Scott, she's the executive director of the National Center for Science Education, and she is the one who has led some of the debates about evolution versus creationism. Science is a limited way of knowing, looking at just the natural world and natural causes. 
There are a lot of ways human beings understand the universe through literature, theology, aesthetics, art, or music. What she's saying there is those things aren't science, but it is a way of understanding the world. A lot of our students um, wonder about this word, this word um, natural, natural world. What does that mean? What does that mean to you, that science studies the natural world? As opposed to the supernatural, <laughs> things that can be observed or yeah. all the walls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's natural and there's supernatural. Okay. So the idea that science can study anything in the natural world, humans are part of the natural world as well. So that is one also piece of the idea of what is science. It's, it's studying. Anything around us, anything in the world around us, um, including astrophysics, right? Anything in our, in our, I guess, farther than we can see, right? But as long as it's something that can be tested, observed, then consider it to be science versus the supernatural. Okay, more on that <coughs> in a little bit. Um, so this is from the understanding um, science from that website and the. It's just www.undsci.berkeley. Some say science is our knowledge of the natural world and the process through which that knowledge is built. So this is something that the students pick up on as well. It's, it's a body of knowledge, but it's also the process by which that body of knowledge was acquired. Um, the process of science relies on the testing of ideas with evidence gathered from the natural world. Science as a whole cannot be precisely defined. Are you surprised by that? I'm saying it can't really be precisely defined, but can be broadly described by a set of key characteristics. So again, this is Understanding Science website from Berkeley. This is their understanding of what science is. Here are some of those key characteristics. Okay, um, on the left here it says consistent, plausible, you know, conceivable, um, makes explanations, and is self-correcting. Huh? What do you think that means, the self-correcting part? If you come up with a better explanation, then that's the accepted explanation. Okay, all right. Anybody have a different idea about that? I think the self-correcting is constantly being refined. So we had the global warming, uh, a lot of global, global warming things here. And because of the nature of politics, uh, economics, we were talking about global warming in a different light than we did 10 years ago, than we did 30 years ago. Maybe the scientific method hasn't changed, but a lot of other uh, non-scientific human parameters, so social parameters have changed. And so we're self-correcting those based on our economic backgrounds, our political views. Mm -hmm. So it's a very human endeavor. Very interesting. I, I was always wondering about that global warming one too. It's like 10 years ago, would I have put it in one particular category and then more recently would I have split it to a different category? And so even, is it the science that's changing? Well, you know, even uh, the National Science Foundation, the types of uh, vocabulary they can use to describe global warming, global heating, global ovens, or something else has been changing as well. Mm -hmm. What scientists say about it? And in the 70s, there was talk of global cooling, and we made a complete switch. And so from a research standpoint, there's been some very good discussion on that global warming is partially an invented problem because the nature of research is if you can convince people that there's a problem, the next step is to convince people to pay you money to try and solve it or to try and observe it. And so some of the, you know, the nature of research is getting grants and you're not gonna get people to give you grants unless you can convince them that there's an issue or that there's a problem that you're trying to solve. Wow. What do you think about that? Mark? 
Yeah, that's wandering off into the which way do we use the tools of science kind of thing, which is heavily socially mediated and culturally <laughs> mediated as well. Um, I guess I go back when I tried to teach what's, what science is years ago, and, and it's kind of antique now. I looked at Chamberlain's uh, multiple working hypothesis idea that you have a, for any thing that you're interested in investigating, it could be anything, and that's, again, often socially or culturally mediated. Then you use some of the tools that have proved effective at, create, at looking at verifiable reality. So you might make a series of, of hypotheses, not one, because the minute you have one and weld yourself to one, your worldview will transmit down to proving that as opposed to disproving. But the big thing with science, the reason it's self-correcting, and you often hear that it's different than belief, beliefs do self-correct a little bit too based on social you know, things that are going on. But in science, you may have to drop it faster than you wish. You know, if, if, if somebody else can come up with verifiable, testable um, information that contradicts you, no matter how much you loved your thing, no matter how big, how much of your career was built on it, it's done. It's over. And one person can do that. And one person can take you down. That one person might not be given that voice. That's that whole paradigm shift thing. But. And that's the social thing, too, the voice. Or you can come up with information that's testable, verifiable, but society may not really have a use for it right now, or might not find it that you know, useful, in interesting, or whatever. Kind of a shrug. Mm -hmm. yes. Or it might be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you had something? Yeah. Well, I think it was the thing that you were saying. It's this idea of you know, science, you know, the social cultural communication of it and how how it's usable by the world view or what community you're within. Because if you're doing it for like you said, a certain community, they would, might support you because you're kind of trying to get their support of what you need, what your goals are. So I also think and I don't know if people use this word, but it's a very ethnocentric thing to your place and where you're from and your social area of how you see it and view it also because you're going to be getting that point of view across. Mm -hmm. And I find that a lot as a cultural science person connecting the two, which for me, I cannot differentiate and separate out that I'm continuing having to teach other the science and the cultural <coughs> side for them to kind of agree or, even, or see my point of view. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> that's me. Yeah, and I sometimes wonder, do we need to enlarge further what science is to add some of these other ideas into our understanding of science, too? So um, this checklist over here, again, it's just some of the things that we already we spoke about. I think the ones down here, I mean, it's evidence testable. The ones down here, I think, um, are interesting to discuss involves the scientific community, leads to ongoing research, and benefits from that scientific behavior that we've been talking about, too. So um, just one more, I want to. The article that the students read that was by this Lemke um, would have some issues with what the criteria for science is up here because something is possibly missing <coughs> here. And it has to do a lot with what you were just saying also about the cultural aspect of this. And Lemke is, is arguing that what's missing from this list is something that perhaps we could call gender, cultural sensitivity, and cultural knowledge um, to really be able to, to look at how do we all look at the world and is it is it not scientific just because we're saying it's not scientific? Or can we, in fact, enlarge that idea of what is scientific, too? So to include more about gender, cultural, and cultural knowledge. Okay, so based on these things, um, we do, um, in, our, in one of our classes, we do an activity called UBLEC. Are you familiar with UBLEC? Some of you are? Yeah, some of you? OK, so UBLEC is actually an activity where the students get to play around with this really weird substance. And they don't know what it is, but they look to find, are there some statements that we can make about this, scientific statements, 
that we can all agree to. And the substance is actually like cornstarch and water. If you ever played with cornstarch and water, it's really weird, right? So supposedly scientists don't really even know why it works the way that it works, which is an interesting thing. So they try, you know, they have a whole bunch of tools that they use with it, and they really try to make some sense of this. And in the process of it, they are doing science. At the end of it, they talk about how did we act like scientists? And then they go on to an engineering thing, like could they create um, some sort of, um, it, Ubek is supposed to be an ocean on Mars, I think. So it's really weird substance. So they want to create something, uh, a spacecraft that can land on this material and be able to rise up again. And all they know about this material is that one person, one landing, was able to grab some of it and they took it back to, um, to the world and they just figured out that it wasn't harmful. That's all they know about it. So then the kids feel like, okay, we can use this, right? But they have to figure out, it's like, the kind of substance is, when you squeeze it fast, okay, it's a solid. When you squeeze it slowly, it's a liquid, okay? When you pound on it, it's as hard as a table, okay? But if you just, you can just dive your hand right to the bottom of it if you go slowly. So how do you describe this substance? So this is an activity that they take into the elementary schools to talk about what did we do? How did we act like scientists? What observations did we make? What kinds of explanations can we make based on this? And so forth. And how do we apply this as a scientist? Okay. Um, just last one here about science is or is not um, the absolute truth, but rather our current best approximation <laughs> based on available evidence. Yep. A lot of times students will say something like, well, this thing about the pyramids, you know, people um, about like where they made by aliens and so forth. It's like, well, that's what we thought in the past based on the kind of data that we could gather. Maybe that data was gathered in some scientific way. But now we know that, well, I don't know, some of us think that perhaps that's not a scientific statement at this point. But get more evidence. Uh, democratic. You can't vote on science. Now, just coming, having come out of the Bush administration, you might think that's not true. Um, but it is based on evidence. So, but you're all, you know, you're talking about the politics of science. Who gets the money? Okay, sort of thing. But the idea is, though, as Mark was saying, that it's not like the compendium of, of scientists who say, yeah, we all agree, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's like one person with the evidence can show that it is, in fact, scientific. That it is, this is what we know now, okay? Doesn't matter how many scientists there are with a particular opinion, the evidence is what counts. It's not the authority of the scientist, but the quality of the evidence that provides the strength of the argument. So the question is, why, for so, so long, have we been having this, this idea that maybe global warming is happening, but maybe it's not, and if it is, it might not really be that bad, or the end of the world is coming. What is it that we had these fine, upstanding scientists who are not agreeing on the evidence that they're finding? So, um, the, the scientist that I work with um, is from Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at Berkeley. And she provided us with um, a talk in the class about global climate change. About why is it that we're having so much trouble with this idea of climate change? Why is it that the public has this idea that scientists don't agree about it? Okay? So it was very interesting, and I have the PowerPoint slides if you would like them all. Oh, so what's the controversy about it? Um, and the students asked their friends what they knew about global climate change and if they believed in it or if they thought there were still a lot of issues about it, what they, they knew about it. And then they brought in a piece of 
um, contemporary popular something, video, a book, or whatever. And some of them found them in like Shape Magazine, things about global climate change and what kind of makeup do you need to wear now that global climate change is happening? Okay, so why is it, you know, why is there so much controversy about it? Okay, um, there are some interesting ideas out there. Who would like to share something that you've been talking about at your table? Every table is totally different, do I have to say. Very different. The conversations that went off here. Who would like to share? For the first one, it is absolutely necessary. Okay, I um, can't let you get away with that. <laughs> okay, tell me more. Uh, you know, we talked about two things. It, it develops, it, it's a way to, to develop critical thinking skills and to be able to, to determine what's purely based off of opinion versus what we would consider scientific observations. Um, so, uh, Darius brought up, you know, look at the whole um, No Child Left Behind, which is a big education system. For better or worse, it's here, and it completely removes science out of the curriculum. It's math and reading, and science is not even involved anymore. That's a travesty. I mean, it's an actual travesty that we have that. But, I mean, we all agreed at our table that we think it's very necessary um, for the public to know um, scientific practice and things about nature, and it just develops you know, that critical thinking skills that I think is important. And it's a healthy skepticism. Mm. Okay. Would you like to follow up to that? Yes, Carla. Well, I, I'd also say that um, not only is it important uh, for the public to be in the know about um, nature and practices of science, but for them to be in the know also influences the science itself. I mean, the public can influence policy and management and that can sometimes influence mm -hmm. what science is being done and what you know science gets funded. So it's important them, for them the public to have an understanding of science and what science is. Other ideas, comments? Well how much how much do you think the public is aware of the nature and practice of science too. And uh, one of the things, I was at the AG, no, yes, the AGU conference a couple of years ago when Al Gore was there. And he was pretty much railing on the scientists, talking about you need to start sharing more with the public. And he brought up something about, too, about Scientists sounding so tentative. Right? Mm -hmm. So think about that, the tentative nature of science. Now, one, I'm going to ask you, like, why do scientists always sound so tentative? And on the other side, I'm going to say, so what would it be like if the public understood why the scientists sound so tentative? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Liz was just mentioning that too, and my own kids have this problem with science fair. Science fair, sorry, judging science fair, and you go in, and the kid says, I approve my hypothesis. And the teacher says, yes, they approve the hypothesis. And recently, my daughter did a, a thing on um, bacterial populations on algae and DNA and stuff, and, and my wife was like, well, she didn't prove anything. I'm like, no, pretty much not. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, there is this, Always, this, science is not comfortable. If you really, it's almost like like uh, out in the poet used to say, you know, good poetry make his hairs rise up in his face. And if you're doing science right, I, I would argue that you're going to be in that same thing. You don't prove anything; you're just disproving stuff and seeing what's left. And that is inherently unsatisfying for the general public because what they want is, you know, they want a truism. Dang it! That's how people make money, fortunes by giving people truisms that fit within what they got. And so scientists are stuck in a nasty place. So the more that we can get those kids coming through to understand what science is, yes, because then at least they have some understanding of what we're up against. You know, why can't that scientist just straight up and say, this is the way it is, and why the minute one scientist does, all the other ones go, wow, what are you doing? You know. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, made me think too about the whole idea of what it's, it's just a hypothesis it's just a theory sort of thing right 
the whole idea about what do those things mean too. Um, and it's just like a problem with vocabulary, right? The semantics. Semantics. Okay, so, and this, this tentative um, nature idea, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is how the global climate scientists got together, right, and put out, what is the name of that? What, what is it? The, yeah, yeah, I, I, have it, I have a picture of it here. But when they all, the climate scientists kind of all got together and said, yes, this is really happening. And I had this, in, I envisioned that they did this for the public and for politics in a lot of ways. It's not something that scientists usually will do, right? They're not all saying, yes, I vote for that. You know? But they did come together with a stronger voice, and I, I think maybe that worked. It was kind of interesting. So, so these ideas about you know, what does it mean to be scientifically proven, four out of five dentists agree, you know, what kind of data is good enough, et cetera. Um, how did you collect your data, is it repeatable? So what I'm thinking about now is up until this very moment, for the last hour or so, you've all been as our students, as our college students taking the course, right? You've gone through exactly the same experiences and discussion prompts that our students have gone through. You didn't get to read some of the background papers, etc. but you went through a, a session of the course. Now I want you to become the instructor of the course, not the students in the course. Okay, so shift roles, sort of meta level. And think a little bit about why you might or might not want students that you're teaching to spend a couple hours grappling with the nature of science in this very uncomfortable, unsatisfying way, right? We still didn't come up with an answer, right? We still didn't agree on all of our criteria, and it's not like there's a nice, tidy thing, and one of the slides even says that you can't even precisely define it. So I want you to think as instructors, as educators of college students, is it important for the students to grapple with the nature of science before they are in a position to be communicating with the public, either in a classroom or an aquarium or wherever they encounter the public? Their parents, their kids in their dorm rooms, etc. Um, so talk about that. Think about it first. So first of all, collect your own thoughts. Why or why not would you use a chunk of class time to focus on the nature of science. Um, and then a little bit about, okay, so how is this, how might this influence the students or equip students to go out into the world communicating about, about science? Okay? So would you include it? Why or why not? And if so, how is this going to affect your students when they're communicating with the public? So think for a minute first. And then I'll say, give you another cue to start talking with other people at your table. If you want to jot down notes or, uh, or just think in your head, that's OK. But just take a minute and collect your own thoughts. Yeah, let's, um, let's just share out some of these ideas that are coming up. They're very rich conversations at all the tables. <clears throat> um, And on the one hand, I'm hearing things like, well, you know, science is the sort of, you know, has criteria and it's observable and testable and repeatable. And then I'm hearing, hey, if you think that, you know, we're not just used car salesmen, you got another thing coming because scientists have opinions and views and trying to sell, et cetera. So, so let's just have some of this discussion with the whole group. What's the value or not value of having students who are going out working with the public to grapple with the nature of science? I, I think that, well, we, we decided that, yes, it's absolutely imperative that, that the students are armed with, with the, the right information about the scientific method because um, partly there's a cascade effect. You know, you send them out there and, and they're, they're teaching sometimes to not such a receptive audience. Um, if they can't defend it, and explain it properly in a way that they understand it and other people can understand it, then it does science a disservice because then they become not so credible. 
and then people poo poo science. Um, so there is a, a bit of a cascade effect and also um, adaptability. You know, to this critical thinking that Ray talked about earlier. Um, it's, it's a way to, to look at the world, a different sort of way to look at the world and, and evaluate the world. And uh, if they don't know how they're, the method by which they, they're coming to these conclusions, then uh, you know, you're sending them out naked, really. Right. Does science a disservice. Yeah, so interesting, it's a different way of looking at the world. Is that what you, the words you use? So. That, that, it, that there is this thing, the national standards call them scientific habits of mind, mm -hmm. right? There's certain ways that scientists view the world, behave, communicate with each other that are a little bit different than the social norms in the rest of the community, right? And so it's maybe helpful for students to understand how and why they're different when they're talking about science from other parts of their life. Any, anybody else have other? Thoughts about that or scenarios that you can imagine a student might find themselves in where this having grappled with the nature of science might be helpful to them. With, with junior high kids, I've had the discussion of what is and isn't science, and I find it very helpful. And I think I'm probably sort of repeating some of what Jeff is saying here. It's very helpful to be able to narrow it down and define it in a fairly narrow way. It goes back to the evidence and observable uh, phenomenon like this because there are many questions then that they bring up that I say, okay, these are important, but they're not science. And it's kind of important for them to understand. I believe it's important for them to understand that there are different ways of knowing and making decisions about things in their life. And certain things need to be done with the supportable evidence, but some things aren't. Um, you know, ecologically, if I look at biology, I should kill my stepchildren. Um, but that's not ethical, <laughs> and I'm also not going to do it. <laughs> because I think it's about, you know, so there are certain questions that are answered scientifically, and certain that, are, that aren't. Your tape was stopped. I don't think I want to sit next to you. Say wait for my for lunch. So I'm I'm thinking, you know, students going into a your students going into a classroom. Um, or out on the floor of Waikiki Aquarium and talking about a concept or a phenomenon and getting a response from one of the learners that really is uncomfortable and really challenges, you know, like, whoa, you, I don't believe that. That's not true. My parents have told me, you know, I heard somewhere, I, you know, where do, what, where do your students go with that? How are, how are they going to handle those situations that very skilled educators, present company, you know, have a hard time with? And your students going out for the first time you know, with a little uh, kit of materials and thinking we're going to go out and teach some people some cool <laughs> ocean things. What would you tell them about encountering those situations where their scientific view is not in accord with some other view that their learners are bringing. I'm sorry, I just wanted to share that um, it helps if you give them that idea beforehand of having them have one topic and having two people before or against, no matter what their opinion is, and to present it as a debate to show that how that same information can be presented on two sides so that they're able to you know, discuss the, or listen to the two sides when they're out there in the field. Sometimes you know, they have to practice that a little before going out, I think. Well, it seems like this discussion, having been through this process of discussing what, what is the science, what science um, will help, helps remind us to, to um, to be open to the process, you know, when that comes up, as opposed to just being adamant about a position. 
So to be to, to refer to the process of science rather than to take a, a position when somebody asks that uncomfortable mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. <laughs> is a good strategy. You know, mm -hmm. you could coach people to do that. Right. So yeah. So listening carefully. Listening carefully, having some empathy or some understanding. Getting to the principles of science. Any other any other thoughts about this about how you might use a nature of science setting, a nature of science <coughs> session <coughs> like this in your local context, whether you're teaching a course or staff training for your uh, naturalists, or I mean, is this something? How how might you use this type of a tool? I think a lot of us get the evolution creation thing where either in a formal setting, oh, I don't believe that, but I'll give you the answer that you, I think you want or will refuse to write the, the, the answer based in evolution and we'll give the creationist answer or in a non-formal setting where, you know, this, this is a, a Baptist school where, you know, so ease up on the, on the evolution stuff. <laughs> um, we've all run into that. And you know, how, do you, how do you address that? You know, different, if you ask all of us, I'm sure we'll have 20 different answers how we, we address that, but it's important that we do. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. And, and we address it in ways that are just as unsatisfying and uncomfortable as the discussion that we've been having about the nature of science, right? There's not a right way. There's not a right answer to tell the person coming from the Baptist school or, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but if you haven't thought about it before, you're really in trouble. Yes. Right? You might be in trouble anyway, but we know you're really in trouble <laughs> if, you, if you haven't thought about it. Sure. And, um, and so as many opportunities as we can provide for the students to think about things in advance and also to be comfortable with unresolved situations, right? It's not their job to fix it or solve it or convince anybody or, you know, but they just need to be there and, and listen carefully, be respectful, share what they think, be open back, et cetera. Th you know, those are the kinds of things that, and, and these are not things that you typically learn in a four-year university, right? You're taught to have the right answer. And if you don't, then you're wrong and you get it, you know, you don't score well, you know, you're not successful. That's the definition of success. Having the right answer in a setting like you're describing may get you in more trouble than being a little bit quieter, taking a step back instead of a step forward, listening carefully, engaging, etc. So that's, those are the tools that we're trying to provide that don't come naturally for a lot of students that have succeeded in the system in which they currently are, right? They're, they're trained to do different things. And in this particular case here in Hawaii, we particularly want to think about modifying the course to open up the perspective to include ways of knowing in, in indigenous cultures and traditional knowledge, et cetera. So we even have to think more carefully about this here than we might in California or in New Jersey or in other places where the course is currently being taught. And there's a lot that the rest of the country is gonna learn about how the course gets modified here. Because there, of course, there's traditional knowledge everywhere. It just isn't as prominent and not as well understood in many places um, as it is here. Um, so we're really hoping to take this, we wanted to do this session on the nature of science first because it kind of sets the stage. What is the nature of science? What is the nature of traditional knowledge? What is the na nature of other cultural ways of knowing? And we'll use this as sort of a foundation to build on all the other elements of communicating about ocean sciences. Um, so thanks for sort of struggling through that with us and helping us. We haven't done you know, this in a place like this before, and we're learning also about ways to facilitate these discussions. So thank you all very much.